I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Every Bible is going to turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. It has been a privilege to be walking through the book of Exodus as long as we have over the whole summer. And last week, we entered into Exodus chapter 32, which was a tremendous, grievous chapter about idolatry, about how quickly we can turn from following the Lord to then engaging in sin that totally is against the Lord 100%. And we walk through that chapter and finally we come to chapter 33 and 34 and we have to ask the question, can God restore us? Can God take us in our failure and restore us to a right relationship to him? I hope you know that there is good news. The answer to that is yes, but the Lord takes us through a process of restoration, and I want you to see it as we walk through the scripture and to meet him face to face and be free in Christ. So in the honor of God's word, if you're able and willing, I'd ask you to stand this morning in the honor of God's word, and we're gonna begin in Exodus chapter 33, verses one through six. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people. When the people heard This disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, we humbly come before you. Lord Jesus, please show us who you are and what keeps us from you. Lord, may you do a work in us as you're about to do in and through your word. Restore us. Lord, may we be reunited with you and be changed by you. We pray for this. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Here in the very first six verses, we come face to face with a consequence of sin, and that is separation, that we were made for a relationship with the Lord. And here we meet with an immediate consequence that the Lord is saying he is about to actually give us all that he promised to give us, but he's not going to be in it. How do we receive that? Do we receive that as the scripture says, a disastrous word? Or does that not even hit us at all? That in fact, we just give us the stuff, Lord. We don't actually want you. But in the reality is that he is everything. He is everything. We were made for a relationship with him and our sin cuts us off. Take a look. Come back with me to verse number three and four. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people. What is this clearly communicating? He is holy, and we are not. It's impossible to have a relationship with him if we remain in our rebellion. That's not possible. And the reception of this word in verse number four is when the people heard This disastrous word, they mourned and no one would put on 
his ornaments. Those ornaments, those decorations, that jewelry, was, that was received from Egypt. And that jewelry actually was taken in Exodus 32 and was made into the golden calf. And no one, when they receive a disastrous word, wants to celebrate. No one wants to parade around them. There's mourning taking place. And the question is, is that what's taking place in, in our own hearts? When we sin, when we commit idolatry, I mean, does it mourn us that there's a separation between us and the Lord? Because there's two different types of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow, which is sorry over the fact of a loss or that you got caught and there's shame and there's guilt and there's sorrow there. But there's a difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow because godly sorrow not only is mourning over the consequences, they are mourning over the loss of a relationship. And that is a revealing of our heart. I mean, are we mourning when we sin over a loss of a relationship with our Lord that we have been separated from him? Because that should be one of the indications of a restoration process is that there is a sorrow, a godly sorrow over our sin and the breaking of a relationship. That is the first indication that our Lord is taking us through a process of restoration is there is a godly sorrow. And then the Lord then intervenes, beginning in verse number seven. Take a look. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meaning. Once again, recognize the details. Recognize the separation here. That that tent, that tabernacle, was meant to be in the center of the camp. Here it is on the outside, the far side of the camp. Once again, revealing the separation. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up. Each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. What is being communicated here in verses number seven all the way through? What's being indicated and clearly communicated is that we are constantly in the need of a mediator. Who's gonna go before us? Who's gonna go before a holy God and plead our case? We know, we've taken a look over and over again and through the scriptures, we know that Moses is a foreshadowing of the ultimate mediator, Jesus. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Why? Because he's perfect. He is not only God, he's fully man, and he has had the payment price, and so he goes before us to plead our case. We are always in the need of a mediator. And also here, we're also seeing the intimacy that God has with Moses, the intimacy that he yearns to have with us. Take a look at verse number 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now we also, I hope you know this passage, we're gonna come to a place where God says to Moses, no man can see my face and live. What's being communicated here is not that Moses is actually seeing God face in his face, but there is a description of the intimacy. Like there is a clear line of communication. They're speaking to one another as a friend would speak to a friend. There's a intimacy that's being described and that should speak to us about what God wants with us in a relationship. That's why there should be godly sorrow. Why? Because we should be yearning for this intimate relationship the Lord wants to get, give to us, that he wants to meet with us, that he wants to speak to us as a friend speaks to a friend. There's also a side note. I want to make a little side note here, not necessarily among the sermon, but this is, this is free for you. Take a look at verse number 11. It says, when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Man, this is a word to young men. Young men, if you want to be useful to the Lord, this is about being in the presence of God, not about your talent, not about your giftedness. The one that's really useful to the Lord is the one that wants to be in the presence of God and not leave his presence. That's who I look for. When I look for a young man to invest in, I want that young man who wants to be in the presence of God constantly. Not the most talented, because we know that God used Joshua to lead them into the promised land. Why? Because Joshua loved the Lord. He wanted to be with the Lord. 
So that's just free information. You can take that as you want. Here we go. Let's look at verse number 12. Here's the interaction between God and Moses. Moses says to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. Moses is going before us and he's going and he's interceding on our behalf to the Lord. Verse number 14, God, and God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring me up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Now, this interaction may seem a little bit strange to us because it seems like Moses doesn't really hear the Lord and kind of then repeats for us. But actually what's happening here is that God is speaking to Moses and making a promise to him only. That's why we're, this is where the King James Version actually is very helpful in these moments because they have the thing called these and yees. Do you guys remember this from the King James Version? In the King James Version, it brings a clarity. In verse number 14, he's speaking to Moses only. I'm gonna give you my presence. I'm gonna give you my promise to you only. Moses in verse number number 15 is saying, don't bring us up from here. And he's saying us, not just me, Lord, but your people. Don't bring us up from here. And here is a clear process of restoration where the Lord is saying, man, do we have godly sorrow? And he's about to bring about a heart desire change. Do we want him? That's when you know the Lord is bringing you on a path of restoration where there is godly sorrow, but he begins to change your heart desires. It's not about wanting stuff. It's about wanting him. Why? Look what Moses says about this in verse number 16. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. What made them special? Not their gifts, not their talents, not their numbers, not their creativity. No, what made them special was the Lord. What makes us special is Him. It's a relationship with Him. That's what makes us distinct. That's what makes us special. And the Lord is entering, bringing us, inviting us into this process of restoration, helping us understand the severity of sin in the beginning, helping us understand that separation. But now he's bringing us into a heart change and a desire to say, Lord, I want you. Lord, I want to fall in love with you. This is what this whole section is about. It's about falling in love with the Lord, saying, Lord, no, you are what's special. Lord, you is what makes us distinct. Lord, I want you. That's falling in love. And you know what it's like to fall in love. All other loyalties are laid aside. You are so focused and dependent upon that person because you're in love. You're so in love that you become annoying. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, like, you're so in love. That's the relationship the Lord yearns to have with us. Do we really want him? Or do we want his stuff? That's what's going on in this interaction. That's what's happening here in this intercession is that there's a clarity about what really is of value and he is of the utmost value. We should desire to be in a relationship with him. So much so Then Moses makes a very special request. Take a look at verse number 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Once again, that intimacy. Moses said, please show me your glory. Moses is saying, Lord, I want more of you. This is the same Moses that, met the Lord at the burning bush in Exodus chapter three. 
This is to say Moses that would help lead out the people out of bondage out of Egypt, experienced all of the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. He saw the power of the Lord on display. This is the same Moses that saw the Lord descend upon Mount Sinai. This is the same Moses that was invited in to the presence of the Lord, received the Ten Commandments by the hand of God, spent 40 days in his presence in on Mount Sinai. This same Moses is saying, Lord, I want more of you. Man, that's a hard desire. I mean, Lord, I want more of you. I want to see your glory. I want to see all of you, Lord. I want to know all of you. It's like Paul in Philippians 10. Lord, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. Moses is saying, I want more. That should be the desire of our heart. Lord, we want more of you. And here's what God says in verse number 18, verse number 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my, away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Here the Lord is about to grant his request, but he's gonna grant it in a way that we're able to receive it. That's the graciousness of our Lord. We can't receive all of him. We can't receive all of him in our fallenness, but our Lord out of his graciousness says, man, I'm about to let my goodness pass before you. I'm about to proclaim my name. And that actually takes place in chapter 34. Take a look with me. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, 10 commandments. Be ready by the morning. And come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord, so here's a continuation of chapter 33. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Just what he said in chapter 33. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. This is the, the name Yahweh, the covenant name. The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Here we come to one of the great revelations of scripture, where our Lord in his graciousness allows Moses to partially see his back and hear the pronouncement of his name, which is revealing his great character. And in the midst of our brokenness, and in the midst of our failure, we meet a gracious Lord who wants to welcome us home. Take a look at his description. Take a look at his character, beginning in verse number six. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, his covenant name, the Lord, a God merciful. To those of us who are in need, our Lord is merciful. He is compassionate. In every one of us in this room, we have a need. There are things that are overwhelming. There are things that are too great for us. There are things that are mysterious to us. We are in great need. And our Lord is compassionate. It also says in the scriptures that our Lord is gracious. Our God merciful and gracious. To those of us who cannot measure up, our God is gracious. And there's no one in this room that can measure up. By our own performance, who can ascend the hill of God? Who can enter into his holy presence? None of us. We are all not measuring up. Yet our Lord is gracious. 
Look in the scriptures. For those of us who are rebellious, he's what? Slow to anger. Those of us who are no rebellion and who have committed rebellion, our Lord is slow to anger. The direct opposite of who we are most of the time, our Lord is slow to his anger. For those of us who are unfaithful, what's the scripture say? Take a look. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. That means thousands of generations. Even when we are unfaithful, he is faithful. Why? It says in the scripture, he cannot deny himself. And even when we commit idolatry, our Lord is faithful and he has steadfast love and he's extending that steadfast love to us. And not only that, but look at this. He says, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin to us who are guilty, our God is forgiving. That is incredible. That is absolutely amazing. That should blow all of us away that our Lord in his goodness and his kindness is revealing all of his great character. But also there's a word of warning. Don't miss the the second half of verse number seven. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation, meaning to the unrepentant, our God is just. And he will deal with our unrepentant sin. So hear that warning, please. But man, I want to turn our attention to the Lord and the graciousness of his revealing his covenant name and the fullness of his character. Because where do we see all of this in its clarity? We see it when he comes himself for us. We see it in Jesus. We see the fullness of God's character in Christ. When he came, do we see the compassion of our Lord in Jesus when he comes and he meets people in their infirmities? He meets them in their difficulties. Does he display his mercy and his compassion? Yes. Does he display graciousness? Yes. Does he display a slowness to anger? Yes, he does. Does he display faithfulness? Absolutely. Does he display a desire to forgive? Yes. We see it over and over And we see it, I think, most clearly when the Lord is bringing about a clarity even in through the parables. Luke 15, which you know very familiar, is a place where our Lord is demonstrating his compassion towards sinners. And who's most upset about this are the religious leaders, those who are Pharisees. So he tells a series of parables which finds its climax in the parable of the lost son in Luke chapter 15. Do you remember this parable? Do you remember how wretched the Lord describes the younger son? Do you remember how reckless and how heinous his sin was to the point to where a young Jewish boy is now longing to eat that which he's feeding to the very pigs, the lowest of low that you could possibly be. Yet he has the audacity to want to come home. Like, what's his father going to do? How's his father going to receive him? And this young man has the audacity to want to come home, to be a servant in the house of his father, comes home. What's the reaction of the father? Does the father turn his back upon the son? No. His father's looking for him. And when his father sees him, he runs to his son, this gross, smelly kid, he quickly wraps his arms around that son and embraces him and places upon him those signs of sonship, a ring on his finger and shoes upon his feet and a robe for him. And he begins to say, let's eat and celebrate for this son of mine was lost and has been found. He's been dead. He was dead. And now he lives. There's a celebration that takes place with the father. That's the Lord that we serve. That's the Lord who says, Come home. You're welcome home. We've all messed up. We've all sinned. We're all guilty. And our Lord is saying, come home. I've revealed my character. I'm merciful. I'm gracious. Slow to anger. I'm forgiving. I'm faithful. Come home. The only person that's upset about this whole thing is the elder brother because he's lost and he doesn't know it. But when you're lost and you know it, 
Our Lord has compassion to receive us home. And where do we see all of the character of God fully on display? It's on the cross. It's Jesus going and paying a price that was not his own. It was upon the cross that we really see the mercy of God. It's upon the cross that we really see the grace of God. It's upon the cross that we see the faithfulness of God and the slow to anger. And we see the forgiveness of our Lord is upon the cross where he paid our price. And the resurrection, the defeating of sin and death says the Lord does have the power to deliver upon all of his promises. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. And forgiveness is real. Don't miss that. Forgiveness is real. And he's come for us. And the restoration is real. And it's full. Did you see the worship of Moses? But man, I want you to see verse number 10 of chapter 34. Look what God says. And he said, behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation and all the people among whom you are, sh you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Our Lord doesn't just bring us home to forgive us and make us second class citizens. No, he brings us home in a full restoration and we are a son and daughter of the king. And he is saying, I'm now gonna use you to display my glory. Hear that. I mean, that restoration is full, it is real. And man, he wants to put himself on display in and through you. You are useful to the king. He has the power to change us and our future. Man, I want you to see how the Lord does this because he reestablishes the covenant. Beginning in verse number 11, he repeats all the covenant and reestablishes it with the people of God. But I want you to jump down to verse number 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him at Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he had came out and told all the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Here's a moment of incredible transformation. Moses didn't even realize it. In the presence of God, Literally, physically, his face was changed. Hey, let's be honest. For all of us, that's great news, right? I mean, we're like, we're getting a new face. We're shining. What, like amazing transformation taking place? Yes, being in the presence of the Lord changes you physically. He's been changed in such a way where other people recognize it. They see something's changed about you, Moses. Your face is shining. And they were fearful of him at first. And Moses would put a veil over him over it in order to then be in relationship with the people, but then he would take that veil off when he went into the presence of God. Do you know the New Testament speaks directly to this? I want you to turn over, 2 Corinthians, this is important, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't want to turn over there, you know it's up on the screen here for you. Verse number 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 12. Listen to this. Since we have such a hope in Christ, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Do you hear this? That shining, that shining that he had upon his face was fading. It was going away and he was hiding the fading that was happening. Look at this, uh, the scripture says, look at verse number 14. But their minds were hardened for to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. 
Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Oh my goodness, do not miss this. What's happening to Moses is just a foreshadowing of what the Lord Jesus wants to give us in greater glory. Our Lord Jesus he wants us to know the Lord fully, to see him face to face. And where Moses is fading, we are called upon in the power of the Holy Spirit to be increasing. Our intimacy with Christ and our Lord increases. Our transformation in the Lord increases by the power of the Lord. Why? Because the tent is no longer a physical tent. We are the tent. The Holy Spirit has made himself and residing within us. And he is changing us from one degree to another, becoming more and more like Christ. Where the promises and things are taking place in the Old Testament, which is the foreshadowing of the full promises of that happens in Christ. Do you realize the Lord Jesus wants to change and transform us? That's the good news of the gospel. Our hearts no longer have to be veiled to the truth of the gospel, but Lord, we can enter into his presence fully and freely because in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, there is freedom. Freedom to say no to sin and freedom to say yes to Christ. That's the good news. And there's some of you who are sitting here this morning you're living in the lie of the enemy and the guilt and shame that he's lofted upon you for years. And the Lord Jesus is saying, I have the power to free you. Will you believe in me? Will you trust me? Will you surrender to him and pour it all out on his feet and let him welcome you home and dwell within you and truly change and transform you, transform you by one degree to the next of his glory to make you like himself? That's the promise of the gospel. And how many of us are selling ourselves short? He wants to remove that veil and he wants us to know him fully. Mm, pray with me this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you that you desire to restore us. Lord, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed here this morning, how many of us are sitting here right now and we're sitting here with guilt and shame that our Lord has the power to remove? Do you have that godly sorrow? Do you sorrow over the loss of relationship? Do you understand the Lord wants to change the desires of our heart to want him to see his glory and to reveal his character? And he yearns and longs to make us new. Lord Jesus, give us the strength this morning to believe and to respond to you and experience the truth of your word. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.